This is the Transforming Anxiety Podcast with Kelly Hanlon McCormick, and today is episode number 184, Anticipation is Worse Than Reality. Welcome to Transforming Anxiety. I'm your host, Kelly McCormick. I'm a mom to two boys, a wife, friend, daughter, and sister, and I'm a certified life coach, yoga teacher, and soon-to-be mindfulness meditation teacher. I'm no stranger to anxiety, and I'm here to teach you how to manage your mind and your emotions so that you too can transform anxiety into calm, peace, and whatever you want for your life. I'm so glad you're here. Hey there, welcome in today. Happy Wednesday. I hope you're doing well wherever you are, whatever's going on for you. Oh, it's so good to be back in the routine of school, of work. There's like such normalcy around here and it feels good. (laughs) Summer's great and all, but man, do I love the school year. New episodes of the podcast, which has been so fun. It was nice to take a break, right? And kind of just let some fresh content brew. But we're also a week into the new meditation course. That's been pretty great so far. All of you who are there joining in for that, it's been awesome to connect and practice and and just hear from you there. Days are getting shorter. If you guys noticed, there's like less daylight out there, which I know seems like kind of a bummer, but also are you getting any more rest because of it? Are you allowing yourself to go with it a little bit and sleep more? And I'll admit, like I am and I'm not. (laughs) I am in the normal, quote unquote, normal days. And we've been kind of on a concert going binge lately. My teenage son and I, we went and saw 21 Pilots uh, last week. And we saw Panic at the Disco recently. So good. My goodness, there's something about live music, like that collective experience of being in a crowd of strangers, like all riding the wave of a song, of a show, of a live experience together. There's like those quiet moments during a concert and the insane moments, noise and lights and applause. That moment when the band strikes a chord and you know it's one of your favorites, you're going to see the real deal right in front of your eyes. I swear, for me, it's like concerts and the mountains, my yoga mat, conversations with my kids. I tell you, these are the places that I can go to feel things. Like if I want to feel, taking myself to a concert is not a bad way in. It's like plugging myself directly into my emotional channel and just opening up the floodgates. So anyway, there's a little sidebar about how much I love live music. Totally random. So let's do this. All right. Today, we're going to explore the idea of anticipation and how anticipation is worse than reality. (laughs) Now, I just want to acknowledge before we get started, anticipation can be great too. It can be way better than the reality. Like you felt that, right? Like, do you remember prom? (laughs) Man, the anticipation for prom, for me, anyway, was great. It was amazing. The dress, like the flowers, the dinner, the group get together, the after party, Oh my goodness, the anticipation. I was so excited for the whole thing. Like you hear about prom, you watch movies about prom. It's built up to be this amazing experience. And then, (laughs) do you remember walking into prom? (laughs) I was like, this is it? This is what all of that rigmarole was for? It's just how I remember it. I can remember just deflating like a balloon throughout that night. Just like little bummer after little bummer. Like same soda as always. Same dumb cookies. Same music. Same silly people from high school were now roaming around the dance floor, dressed up, honestly kind of looking ridiculous and uncomfortable. (laughs) Me included. Whole thing 
It was just kind of eye-opening for me. The anticipation was such a high. It was so great for so long. And then reality. That evening, the actual prom of prom, not as great as the anticipation of prom. Anyway, I want to acknowledge that anticipation can be used in all kinds of ways. It's not a singularly bad thing. But you'll also see how and why that's true as we kind of explore this together today. And I want to focus specifically on the anxiety that we create with anticipation and how anticipation can be worse than reality. All right. So I looked the word anticipate up in the dictionary just to get an idea of what we're working with here. And it says regard as probable and to anticipate is to expect or to predict So to regard as probable. So basically, to kind of assume something is likely to happen, right? To expect a certain outcome. And where does that happen? Where do we assume and expect and predict things? In our minds. Regards and assumptions and expectations and predictions. Those aren't real things. They aren't happening. These are all just other words for thoughts, right? They're synonymous with ideas, stories, opinions, that inner commentary, things we tell ourselves in our minds, or rather, actually a better way to say this is things our minds tell us, because that's how it goes, right? It's not like you want to negatively anticipate something. It's not like you're loving the scary stories and terrible worst case scenarios that you're spinning in your mind. You aren't willingly going there. It's what your mind has offered up. Now, I want to remind you of something. (laughs) You know, our brains are just like a whole mass of tissue or jelly and whatever with electricity running through it, right? Our brains are miraculous and amazing, and our brains have no idea what the future holds. They are not accurate predictors of what's coming, But how often do you believe what you think, right? Your mind offers you an idea, a story, a prediction of how things are going to go when you have that hard conversation with your friend or when you get, when you have to get up and give that presentation at work, right? Your mind predicts what will happen and tells you a story. It's like it projects this home movie onto the screen of your mind and we believe that, We're like, oh, okay, thanks. Now I know how that's going to (laughs) go. Like, really think about that. What? We humans have this tendency to believe the first thought we think. Like our original thought or belief system is by default more right than whatever we could intentionally, logically, rationally create for ourselves. This is interesting that we tend to believe the first thought we think that we don't question it, we don't challenge it, we don't at least pause and take a look at it and ask, huh, is this for me? Do I like this? Especially if you consider that so many of our thoughts and belief systems are handed to us by the culture around us, by our family and friends, by the roles and expectations placed on us by society, by norms and standards, And by our own sheer habit, we think many of the same thoughts today that we thought yesterday and the day before that and the day before that. It's like wild repetition up there. Balzac said, our greatest fears lie in anticipation. All right, so we've recognized that anticipation is 100% happening in our minds, unbidden by us consciously something our minds just hand us. We also see that we fall for it. We believe it. We get on a plane and we say, well, this is going down. (laughs) Right? We prepare for a big deadline at work and say, no way this is going to pass muster. We look at our kids and we worry. We look at our bank accounts and say, it's never going to be enough. We look at our bodies and say, I wonder when this is all going to go to hell. We don't know. We're just picking up the story our mind offers 
and assuming there's some truth to that since we found the story ping-ponging around in our minds. And I want to remind you, we can choose not to pick that up. We don't have to attach to those anticipations. We could flip all of those anticipations around and ask powerful, open-ended questions like, but what else might happen? Or, sure, but there's a thousand amazing ways that this could go, too. All right, here's a good one. Alfred Hitchcock said, there is no terror in the bang, only in the anticipation of it. All right, this is interesting. I was talking with a client recently about anxiety, about feeling anxious so often, and I asked her, do you think if we transplanted you and your family and your job, your house, like all your stuff, right, everything to a different country, all of your circumstances, but if you all of a sudden lived in a country torn apart by war, where you were figuring out how to get food and keeping your family alive and you didn't know whether you'd have electricity or water, do you think you'd be feeling this anxious? And she paused. And then she said, no. No, I wouldn't be anxious. I'd be doing all of the things I needed to do in order to survive and take care of my family. And I said, yeah, right? You wouldn't have the luxury of anxiety. You'd be out there doing things, taking care of things, making sure you and your family made it through the day. Because how much of anxiety is in our heads generated by the fact that we're able to sit around and think about how it's going to go? This is why I say there's almost a luxury to anxiety. So much of it is created because we have the space and the relative safety and the time and the resources to get fully locked in our heads letting our minds run wild. There is no terror in the bang, only in the anticipation of it. There is certainly far less terror in taking action, in getting through the day, in putting one foot in front of the other, than there is in stewing about how it could all go wrong. The anticipation of the bang, that's the terror. And... (laughs) Like, think about this. If you've ever seen one of those horror movies where the creep factor is all in the anticipation, like the music, the hints, the foreshadowing, you know this is true. Like the movie Psycho, this is such a good example of it. Nothing happens the entire movie, right? Nothing ever happens. But you're in such suspense. You're in such dread and anticipation for like an hour and a half or however long it is that you're left kind of exhausted by the terror of the anticipation of the bang. Amazing. All right, Khaled Hosseini, I don't know if I'm saying that exactly right. He's the author of the book, A Thousand Splendid Sons. And he wrote, of all the hardships a person had to face, none was more punishing than the simple act of waiting. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. I want to also acknowledge our tendency to, quote unquote, medicate and run when faced with waiting, with suspense, with anticipation. We don't like it. Have you noticed? (laughs) Because we tend to tell a scary story about what's coming. Because we tend towards really gloomy predictions of what might come to pass. We don't like to wait and see. We start looking around to either entertain and distract ourselves. This is why our phones are just so damn handy, right? Or we look for a power grab. Where can I get some control? Where can I force things and ensure the future? How can I make what I want to see happen, happen? Again, this is a really ripe breeding ground for anxiety. When we have to wait and see... When we quote unquote give up control, because hint, we never really had it in the first place. When we let go and give ourselves over to the anticipation, our minds run wild. Because most of the time, we aren't looking after our minds. We aren't taking care of them and guiding them. 
We're just letting our minds run amok, telling us whatever strange or wild thing they want to tell us. Which is a little like if you got in your car and just hit the gas pedal blindfolded. Like, let's go. What? (laughs) No. Open your eyes. (laughs) Look around. Think about where you want to go. How you want to get there. And then carefully following the laws of the road and checking in with the world around you. Go for it. Waiting is tough for us humans. To be a little bored. To be a little out of control. To be a little unsure about what's coming. Can you just be? Can you just stand here? Can you just wait and see what they say about your work submission? Can you just let the other person really speak without selling them on your idea? Without convincing them to agree with you? And like if you're getting a little twitchy (laughs) just thinking about this, like just considering it, this could be a sign, right? I also really like this sentiment from Gretchen Rubin. She's the author of The Happiness Project and the book Better Than Before. She said, when I find myself focusing over much on the anticipated future happiness, like the happiness of arriving at a certain goal, I remind myself to enjoy now. If I can enjoy the present, I don't need to count on the happiness that is or isn't waiting for me in the future. So, okay, I realize the way she said this is framed in the opposite that we've been talking about it. But like I said at the beginning, this goes both ways. We can lose the here and now. We can lose reality when we tell a story about the future and either convince ourselves it's horrible and terrible and scary or we rely on the future to take care of us happiness-wise or wisdom-wise. Anticipation of the future breeds anxiety. Honestly, whether it's the good kind or the bad kind of anticipation. And the reason is the same. It's because we're not here. It's because we've abandoned our present selves in this moment. And we've mentally time traveled to a fantasy place. A place that doesn't and never will exist. The future is always out there in the future. We can never get it here and now. We can never control it or understand it or convince it to go our way. Negative or positive anticipation, we can generate a lot of anxiety when we leave ourselves. So to close today, I want to offer an antidote to the anxiety of anticipation so that you have like a little something to consider and maybe a little something to practice with this week. And the antidote is presence. I talked about this a few weeks ago in the Mindful Monday series. You can go back and listen to that episode if you want. We did a whole sweet little episode on presence, on staying here, on staying in this moment, on getting into your body and out of your mind. Our minds are great at doing things like changing light bulbs, right? Helping our middle schoolers with algebra, emailing, texting. Awesome. But our minds aren't good at predicting the future. They aren't good about staying still, creating quiet, being in this moment. They're constantly time traveling to the future and to the past, which generates more than a little worry, overwhelm, regret, self-doubt, stress, and anxiety. So try this this week. Give yourself moments to come back to the present moment. Notice when you lose your mind to the future, when your mind gets caught up in a really compelling story about what's going to happen and how it's all going to go down. Our minds are like the best gossipers. (laughs) One little shred of evidence, one little tidbit, and they're spinning like this whole yarn about how the whole rest of your life's going to go. Good Lord, take a breath. Come back to this moment. Recognize the anticipation for what it is. It's a thought. It's an idea. It's a story. It's not real. And you can either pick it up and run with it. You can go all in and believe that. Or you can pause and question it. Challenge it and ask, is this working for me? Is this what I want? 
And if not, you can let go of it. Just let it pass on by. Yeah? All right. Anticipation can be so much worse than reality. Remember that. Stay with what's real. Ground yourself into the here and now. Come back to presence. All right. I will see you at the same time, same place for more transforming anxiety next week. And until then, well, please remember to rate and review the show. If you haven't already, I would be so grateful if you would take a quick second to rate the show, write up a really quick review. It helps our other anxious friends find the show so that we can support as many people as possible with this work. So thank you for that. I will see you soon. And until then, please take care. Do you have someone to help you with your stress, anxiety, worry, and overwhelm? If not, I would love to be your coach. The Fierce Calm Project is my virtual coaching program where we get to go in on topics like this one, and I can help you apply these lessons to your life so that you are creating your own transformation. We do live coaching calls, guided meditations, on-demand yoga classes. We hold book club where we read books your neighborhood book club won't. And there's lots of bonus content that I've created just for you. When you're ready to take what you're learning on the podcast to a whole other level, then come on over and check out the Fierce Calm Project at kellyhanlonmccormick.com slash fiercecalmproject. project.